everybody, this is David Smith from No Kill Colorado. I'm here with Aubrey Cavanaugh from No Kill Huntsville and Alan Rosenberg from the New Jersey Animal Observer. This is No Kill in Motion. We're talking about today, we're talking about microchipping, but very specific, microchipping community cats. So TNR obviously is one of, um, uh, one of the most important things that we all do out there in the field, uh, keeping cats uh, alive that are community cats that may not want to live with humans, um, but it's great to go out there, spay, neuter, and return them um, where, they, where they actually live. But when we do that, um, we generally don't microchip. We do ear tip. Um, some do tattoos. I think more, that's more on dogs than cats. Um, but you see it in both. The ear tipping is the way that we identify in the field that this is an animal that we do not have to trap and bring in again. Um, but microchipping, you know, has value for pet owners. Does it have value in the field? Um, I have run and, and, and spent a lot of time doing TNR in the field. We don't generally do it, and it's purely a monetary choice. That's why we do it. We know that taking these animals in, spay and neutering them, checking them for medical and putting them back, ear tipping them, we, we feel like we can get more done by not microchipping because we, we would waste money there. But there may be value in it as well. I don't know. I don't know what you guys think. Alan, um, why don't you start? Yeah, so I recently had an ordinance. There was an ordinance actually in your hometown, David, or your, your mother's hometown, I should say, uh, in Hamilton, New Jersey, where they proposed a very restrictive TNR ordinance that required uh, caretakers to uh, microchip their, 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 their sterilized and released cats. Um, my view of this is it's a very bad idea, um, purely for the financial reason that you mentioned. Um, when you think about TNR, um, what is what makes a TNR program successful? Well, what makes it successful is scale. You need to sterilize, experts say, around 70% or so or remove a combination of sterilization and preferably live removal, such as adoptions of, of young kittens, uh, of the population to limit the population size and ultimately reduce it. And um, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't think about in terms of TNR is there are a lot of outdoor kittens that die. Um, just like any wild animal, the mortality rate of, uh, of, of litters of kittens is usually over 50%. So the larger the population is, the more uh, outdoor kitten mortality you see. Um, so especially in colonies that aren't managed. So really you need to spend a lot of money to sterilize that 70% of the population. You're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of cats in an area. And if you're a forest can microchip every one of those cats, you're gonna run out of money. Um, and yes, it, it would be nice if, if, if TNR groups had extra money, they could microchip those cats. But even there, I would say, don't do it because you can then start a TNR program in a nearby area that doesn't have it going on. Um, the other reason not to do it is um, elected officials. There may be some elected officials that pass the TNR ordinance uh, on a lukewarm basis or oppose it, but they didn't win the vote. Or maybe there's a future politician that comes in that doesn't like the program. And when a resident starts complaining, they look to shut down the program. And what's the easiest way to shut down a program? Oh, you TNR practitioner, you didn't microchip seven cats. You violated the agreement and the ordinance were shutting you down. Um, and if you look at TNR ordinances from experts like Alley Cat Allies, and the No Kill Advocacy Center, what you see are very short and very general ordinances with few restrictions because you don't want an overly prescriptive ordinance that can be used to effectively shut the program down and reduce its effectiveness. Well, you know, it makes me think if I microchip TNR, who do, don't I, need to do it, who do but, I assign it to? Well, I mean, and, and the if the cat's reason, independent, does the cat have an address and he's assigned to himself? Or <laughs> and, and the other reason not to do it, I should say, is, as you mentioned, cats are ear tips, right? And we know from studies that cats, especially ones that are sterilized, that aren't roaming to mate and being fed, so they're not roaming for food, are literally moving like one or two houses down from where they're being fed. So if you find a cat on the street that's ear tipped, you sh number one, you shouldn't be taking it in unless it's injured or, or sick. And if it is injured or sick, you return it back when it's healthy to the spot where you found it and will find it to its food source. 
So there's really no reason in my in my view for uh, uh, you know returning to habitat uh, reason to to do, to uh, to microchip. Aubrey, what do you think? Um, I'm, I'm in total agreement. I have one idea to throw out there, but I'm in total agreement. And, you know, Alan, you made a really good point. This thing about ordinances that are too specific. Um, we see all the time in the municipal defense field in which I work that if someone has an ordinance or a policy that's got too many details in it, that actually can be to your detriment because then someone can say, oh, but you're not doing subparagraph 3B1. Um, so then they try to make the whole thing look bad. Um, and, and try to do away with it because it's got too many details in it. So that's that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, and David, we're not doing it on the same scale that you are, but the cats that we have in my area, we've been doing TNR near my office for, I don't know, gosh, about 10 years. It was after a landscaper found a litter of kittens um, while they were landscaping and unfortunately moved their nest to a different location. But that started our whole TNR program and over a period of years, our colony has, has really dwindled. It's really small. We have new members come in every now and then because of the proximity of our office to a, um, a housing area with a lot of apartments. Um, but having said that, um, the, the ear tipping method works. I mean, when we trap a cat, we have a rescue group that we deal with. The cat is, they evaluate the cat. I mean, some of these cats are our former house pets that just are lost that we're looking for a meal. So they come to our feeding station to get something to eat. But if they actually are feral, they're not socialized to people, they're spayed, neutered, vaccinated, they tip the left ear so that cat is easily identifiable from a distance and they put them back out. And then when we see cats again, um, everybody in our caretaker crew knows the first thing you do is you look for an ear tip. So let's say that, let's say that we did um, microchip those cats. Well, if it's a free roaming cat, um, the only way that you're gonna check it to see if it's chipped is to trap it again. It's not like free roaming cats let you come and pick them up. They're not house pets, right? So right. that's another thing too. You could throw a lot, a lot of money into microchipping um, and nobody will ever know if that cat is microchipped because the only way you're gonna get hands on that cat again is if that cat is trapped by perhaps a private individual or let's say that cat is trapped because it's sick or injured. That's the only way that you're gonna know. The only thing that I would throw out there, I don't think it should ever be part of an ordinance and I don't think it should be ever part of ordinary operations. I would be interested like with the rescue group that we deal with, if they were to try for a period of, I don't know, a couple of months, maybe using some donated money to, to while they're spaying and neutering those cats to chip them just to see if there is any benefit derived from that over a period of time, just as an experiment. And I would guess that the answer to that would be no. I mean, the only time that it would be beneficial for a, for a community cat to be chipped is if somehow that cat ends up in an animal shelter and we, we wanna keep that animal alive. But I think that the, the benefit, um, the, the cost just really makes it cost prohibitive. I, I don't think you're really gonna achieve any gain from that. And because everybody knows what an ear tip means, I think that that works. There's no, there's no need to microchip. Now, yeah. Owned, yeah. Animal, owned animals for sure, but when we're talking free roaming animals, and Alan's right, they stay within a certain area where they have those resources. So why, why bother? You made me think of something and it doesn't change my mind about what I said. I, I don't think we should be microchipping them. The only time I would see a microchip actually being useful would be in a study. And I think a really long-term study of community cats where you chip the, the entire colony, you spend a lot of money and maybe 10 years actually understanding the life and death of these cats. That would be a really interesting study, way too much money for anything that I do. Um, and that's not about life saving, that's more about um, data research and analysis for I, actually- I think that that would be interesting to do in a location like maybe Clark it, County. One location. Back. Yeah, yeah. Well, one location, it wouldn't be, uh, yeah, it wouldn't like be across the nation. You don't need to do that across the nation to get the study. No, in Vegas, in Clark County, they have a huge community cat population. And I know that there are a lot of people there that work really hard on that population. So it would be interesting in Clark County if somebody, and, and I'm not saying that the rescue do this, but, but maybe some somebody from the scientific community put some money into that and said, okay, you people that are doing TNR in Clark County for one year, we want you to, while you're spaying and neutering, here's money, we want you to chip them all and then let's see what happens. We'll come back at five years and we'll come back at 10 years and see if there was any value in that. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. I mean, I think the, 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 the number of cats in managed talent colonies that end up being unaccounted for or lost, I think are pretty small um, from TNR people I talk to. So 
um, you know, may, you may be able to capture some of those cats, but I still think it would be a pretty small number. Yeah, they usually have names in the, in the in the colonies I know. I mean, the cats all have names. They know each cat. Um, yeah. They're named and, and you know, because they're, they're repeat customers, so to speak, of <laughs> the time, right? But, okay, I think uh, I think we're out of time. This was a great conversation. No, no microchipping for Tina. I think we're just going to leave it there this time. <laughs> we, we don't always agree a hundred percent, but I, I don't see anyone out there who's an advocate that would actually think that this was a necessary thing, but I think it's a good conversation. Thanks everybody. We're here with um, Alan Roseberg from New Jersey Animal Observer and Aubrey Cavanaugh from No Kill Huntsville. I'm David Smith from No Kill Colorado. This has been No Kill in Motion. We'll see you next time.